Hello, it's Bishop Mark, and today we begin chapter 16 of Luke today. And although it's a very complicated story, it takes a lot of explanation, I st I'm still going to read 16, uh, 13 verses of chapter 16, because I think the, the key to understanding 1 through 12 is in verse 13. Let me read verse 13 first. A little different today, but let me read verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. He will either hate one and love the other, or to be devote, devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. See, it's perfectly clear, right? <laughs> Maybe not. Mammon means material things, like things, like money, like your possessions, right? So what Luke is saying is, if God comes first in your life, then God has to come first. God can't be sharing first place with all the material things in your life. We have to put God's first, because if we put material things first in our life, we're going to live these messed up lives that are not focused on what God wants us to do, but what our greediness wants us to do. Okay, so keep that in mind as we now start verses, uh, chapter 16, verse 1. And first is a story of a whole bunch of shady people, a whole bunch of people that are not good. Okay, here it is. Then he also said to his disciples, a rich man had a steward who was reported to him for squandering his property. So it's a rich guy and he can't be everywhere at once. So he has another guy in charge of his, of his stuff in, in one spot, right? So this person's called the steward and he would uh, make sure everyone's doing their job and paying their debts to the, to the rich man. Okay, so, but this rich man was reported to him. They, they told the, the, the rich man that his steward was cheating him, was, we call him, bezeling. <laughs> he was squandering his property. He wasn't, being, it wasn't a good manager at all. So what does he do? He summoned him. So the rich man summons the steward. He summoned him and said, what is this I hear about you? Prepare a full account of your stewardship because you can no longer be my steward. Okay. So he, the steward is caught. The man, the man now knows he's cheating him. And so he's going to inspect the books. He's going, he's going to look at it. And the man knows he's going to get caught, right? It, the, the, it, his game is up. Okay, what does he do? The steward said to himself, what shall I do now that my master is taking the position of steward away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. So this guy knows that he's, gonna, he's losing his job. He certainly can't prove that he was doing well and he's going to lose his job and he could either go to work like be one of the people on the fields or something. He says, I'm not strong enough to dig. And he doesn't want to dig. He just doesn't want to do it. And the alternative, you've you got to be able to feed yourself. So the alternative is begging. He says, I don't want to beg. So I don't want to dig. I don't want to beg. So what, what can I do? I'm caught. I'm in a tough place. I know what I shall do so that when I am removed from the stewardship, they may welcome me into their homes. So if he's fired by the master, everyone will know it. And he'll be an outcast. It'll be hard to beg and hard to find a job, right? So how, he thinks, shall I look good with the people despite the fact that I'm not good? He called in his master's debtors one by one. To the first, he said, how much do you owe my master? He replied, 100 measures of olive oil. 
he said to him, Here is your promissory note. Sit down quickly and write one for fifty. Then to another he said, And you, how much do you owe? He replied, One hundred cores of wheat. He said to him, Here is your promissory note. Write one for eighty. And the master commended the dishonest servant for acting prudently. Okay, so before that verse 8, what does he do? He goes to the people who owe the master money, and on his own authority, he reduces their debt. He reduces her, their debt so that he will look good in their eyes. So they become bad people too because they owe the master something and, and all of a sudden they're going to cheat with the steward. Is there anyone good in this story? So that's what that's his plan. They'll think I'm great and they won't uh, they won't uh, treat me poorly when I'm fired. And that line I read by mistake but now I, I, I read you. After all this the master commended the dishonest servant, steward, for acting prudently. What? Well, <laughs> what it says is the master himself recognizes perhaps himself. In other words, how did he get to be so rich? Well, he probably acted in the same kind of imprudent way bad way that this guy did and he recognized himself and he says ah my compliments you know i see what you're doing <laughs> you're trying to look good and he might be thinking well i look good too that way that's how i got there i don't think jesus is saying anyone in this story is good but he still has four lessons from this story all right Here's the first one, the second half of, half of verse 8. Here's the first lesson. For the children of this world are more prudent dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. You know what that means? <sighs> that we spend all of our time on the wrong thing. Remember the last verse is the cancer of God and money. And people put all their cleverness, all their brain power into cheating other people in money and not in, in God. They're actually quite clever at their schemes. You know, there's, there's people that defraud other people. They're, they're, they're quite clever at it. They, they, the, some of them are bright. They're corrupt and evil, but they're clever. They're bright. And Jesus is just saying they're wasting their beautiful mind on defrauding others, on being bad to others. When they could just be good. Use your beautiful mind for good things. Okay. The next lesson is in verse 9. Here's verse 9. I tell you, make friends for yourselves with dishonest wealth, so that when it fails, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Well, it's a weird way of, of saying we should use, do, use money. We have money. We have things. We can use them for good or we can use them for bad. And the best thing to do is use them for good. If, if you're the rich man, use them to help other people right? Not for bad things, like just to get more money. This is a complicated verse, but I've read a, a little bit about it, and that's what it comes down to. Jesus saying, there's many ways you can use your money if you have it. You can use it for bad or just collect it, or you can use it for good. Okay, the next lesson is in verse 10 and 11. Here we go, 10 and 11. The person who is trustworthy in very small matters is also trustworthy in great ones. And the person who is dishonest in very small matter is also dishonest in great ones. If therefore you are not trustworthy with dishonest wealth, who will you trust? Who will trust you with true wealth? In other words, it's like the last verse. Even if you came by that money 
dishonestly, like that's that rich man. Well, you have to be trustworthy. You have to be uh, good, uh, trustworthy people. In other words, you need to be good. You need to be trustworthy. You need to be do what God asks you to do. And if you if you treat small things well, then you'll get bigger things. How about those people that had all their debts changed? Well, they were they were untrusting in their small matters, and so they cannot become stewards in God's eyes. They cannot become the ones that rule because they're untrustworthy even in the small things. We may be trustworthy in everything. Okay, now we read verse 12. Uh, if, you are, um, if you are not trustworthy with what belongs to another, who will give you what is yours? So that's kind of pointed at the steward, not a trustworthy person. So the final lesson is the last line, which we read at the beginning. He will either hate one and love the other. Oh, no servant can serve two masters. He will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Put God first. Material things are only to be used for God's glory. Be trustworthy. And if you concentrate on God, and don't split your time trying to be clever about gaining money, then you will receive the greatest, rich, richest thing possible, eternal life with God in heaven. Okay, that was a tough one. I admit it's tough. It may take you a while to read it again to see all those four lessons, but uh, there it is. Peace to you. Bye now.